Okay, I think it's uh, three o'clock, so we should start now. So welcome everyone to our uh, webinar. So this is seventh episode of our webinar. And today we have a two guest speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Basque and Professor Philip Kukura. And the first talk I will share and then second talk uh, will be chaired by Professor Michelle Orit. Uh, before I do introduce Martin, so I ask everyone to uh, keep mute except the speaker. And during the question and answers, you can yeah, unmute, ask directly the questions or you can write in the chat and then we can ask the question to the speaker. And um, so uh, about Martin, uh, he did his uh, a diploma at the University of Bayreuth with a group of Professor Lothar Kador. And then he uh, did his PhD at Max Planck Institute for Science of Light at Erlangen in the group of Professor Frank Falmar, where he did his uh, PhD on the topic of level free single molecule detection. After his PhD, uh, he started his postdoc with Marie Curie Fellowship at Leiden University in the group of Professor Michel Orit where he is working on the level-free uh, plasmonic detection and sizing of single nanoparticles and also proteins. And yes, title of his talk today is uh, Photothermal Assisted Optoplasmonic Detection of Single Proteins and Submicrosecond Resolution. So Martin, it's your time. Okay, so Basu, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, also, I don't have to read my title anymore. I uh, thought so maybe it's a good idea to um, give a, like a, a short, a very selective and short overview over uh, optoplasmonic label free detection of single proteins before I go into the, the, the final step of uh, um, going to do this very fast. Um, so uh, the, the whole topic uh, sort of really took off like in 2012 and I think at about the same time. Um, Carsten Sündigsen's group and uh, Michel Reed's group um, detected um, single proteins uh, absorbing onto good nanoparticles. Uh, this was uh, done with um, um, uh, using unspecific absorption as basically um, uh, using the fact that proteins like to stick to surfaces. Um, Irina Armin did this with observing the, the, the longitudinal plasma resonance of single gold nanorods and tracking the, the, the shift of this resonance as proteins absorb through them. Versus in Michel Lutz group, um, this was done with phototherm and uh, worked a bit differently. So I think Peter Zeitstra, um, what he did is basically a heating beam at uh, a fixed frequency is uh, aligned to like the, the side of the flink of an of the LSBR of a single nanorod, and then a probe wavelength, which is far off resonance, is used to probe the phototermin signal induced by the, um, by the heating beam. And then as the, the plasma resonance is shifted again by molecules absorbing, uh, this will change the amount of heat that's generated. And then you can track this as a change in phototermin signal, which is shown here. And this particular signal, I think, was for a 300 kilovolt in protein, if I don't recall correctly. Uh, one year later, um, a similar process was done uh, using whispering gallery modes. Um, uh, whispering gallery modes are a particular type of modes uh, that can be excited in, like in this case, large glass spheres. So they have high order E resonances, which are confined to the circumference of the resonator. And uh, we are total internal reflection and the probe the surrounding medium uh, via the evanescent tail of that field. And the mechanism is very similar to the shift of the plasma resonance. Uh, so if something enters this field, it will shift the resonance of the resonator. And this can be tracked. And this resonance is typically very narrow. And uh, if you then use plasmonic particles, as we are done the first time, I think, by Stephen Arnold's group in Rockefeller University in New York in 2013, in this case, with a plasmonic nanoshell, you can boost the, the near field around the nanoshell, and then if a molecule absorbs there, you get a larger shift, uh, which enables you to actually also see single proteins. In this case, they did this with BNA, BSA. Uh, one year later, um, we did uh, similar things in Erlangen, um, 
but with, we used nanowatts coupled to this uh, to this glass spheres and nanowatts have a bit of better plasma response and better defined near field and we actually managed to detect smaller molecules. In this case, we, we looked at uh, single DNA oligo strands, which, which then would uh, bind to um, uh, respective um, um, complementary strands already immobilized on the on the with nanoparticles. So what I show here are reson phases of resonance shifts uh, over time. And you can see basically when you have an unmodified rod with no DNA present and we inject a matching DNA strand, uh, matching to the, the strand we data uh, put there, you see nothing. Then if you hybridize, uh, put some DNA already, we are dialing onto the good nanoparticle and then inject that. An unrelated in A strand, which has uh, no, match, no rematching uh, sequences um, with, the, with the one that's already on the rod, and sort of also see nothing. And then, if you use one that has very few mismatches, you already see like this the spikes appearing, which are single DNA molecules hybridizing and dehybridizing. So, they go on and off nanoparticles. Um, so, you, you um, and then if you use a full match and the medium conditions are right, this will just bind and you see steps again. Um, I was always very interested in more of this transient interactions, but I will come to this later. Um, you also looked at uh, bigger protein molecules like uh, antibody and then different thing, sorts of uh, inhibition on the surface. So in this case, maybe the lower traces interesting where we block the, the dial one food form here as TS and you see sort of a short interactions of the uh, derivalized DNA, but it doesn't really want to stick around at the surface. And you can also see for if you have a bigger protein, like in this case, it's, a, it's actually an antibiotic and antibody, you get rather big steps, like bigger as compared to the, the previously immobilized uh, derivative extra and in the end. Um, so it's sort of mass sensitive, but uh, uh, the problem is that this was not really, the rods are not really deposited in a controlled way, so you, you can't compare the step sizes between different cavities with different rods, at least we could not back then. So this, this, uh, well, this works nicely, it's not ideal yet. Uh, we also looked at uh, basically enzymes uh, changing the conformation, so basically had the field overlap uh, between the, the, the enzyme and then your feed changes as the enzyme changes conformation. In this case, with a full polymerase, and we, we looked at how its kinetic changes uh, with uh, at, at different temperatures and also with the presence of the entity. So basically, polymerase is a molecule that uh, amplifies DNA in your body. So it takes a single strand and makes a complementary strand on it. So just copies DNA. That's what we looked at there. And uh, it's also nice because you have transient interactions as this uh, opens and closes. Uh, one spike here has multiple opening and closing processes. Uh, this was with, done with a time resolution of 20 milliseconds, so we can't really resolve like a, a single TNTP being added to DNA. That's uh, more like the whole strand. I think we had 100 base per long strand sipping through the polymerase. Um, so what, what always bothered me a bit about this is um, what you basically have to do uh, to, to detect an analyte specifically. Um, so if you do it unspecifically, you just see steps, and then you sort of from the steps you have to determine in some way mass. Uh, this works very nice with IceCAD, for example, but with the rods, the new fits are a bit more complicated. So that's, that's not completely clear, and the problem is when they bind, they sort of like to stick there for very long times. Don't really want to come off, and then after like 20 steps or so, the whole process is over, and you only get one one um, parameter, which is the step size. And the only way you can really be specific is you have to modify these particles with like a specific receptor that uh, preferentially only or best only catches the protein of interest or the, the molecule of interest. And of course, this might be chemically challenging. Um, and ideally, you would have one, want to have one that has spikes. Uh, so it releases the analyte after a short time and is still specific, and that's even harder to do. Yeah, so um, that's something I thought um, maybe maybe it's a good idea to sort of um, get get rid of uh, this, this receptors. And uh, I looked a bit back in time, and um, 
but I found you all already in. So this is different now. This is not uh, proteins, what you see in this traces. This is, in fact, uh, nanorods flying through this evanescent cavity here. And then you, you can observe this via uh, so in the evanescent field stretches out by, by half of wavelengths and we use wavelengths around 780. So I've tried of an extensive uh, field for something in the future. And then actually 20 milliseconds are still enough to, to resolve this diffusion processes to some extent. And once a particle perturbs the sphere, you have two interactions. So once you have the, the shift, which is basically a response to the uh, frequency shift, which is a response to the polarizability, of the nanorod itself, and then you have a change in, in, in the, the line with of the cavity mode. Um, what I forgot to mention is this cavity modes have very high few factors. So at the beginning, when, when you don't have a rod stuck to the cavity, for example, you can have easily um, a line width of like 50 to 100 megahertz, depending a bit on the entrance inside of the cavity. So as a comparison, this is about uh, the, the width of a zero phonon line of a single molecule. At uh, low temperature. Yeah. And the, the second interaction is, of course, the sign with cotton, which is to do extinction. So you, uh, it's uh, you know, basically um, light scattered by the rod out of the cavity, which quite importance the resonance, but also absorbs light. And I thought uh, this on, on the flight detection is good. So, so maybe we can, can do something with it. Um, uh, what I ultimately want to do is, in the end, I want to study biological proteins and uh, let's look a bit on the state of the art, what you can do to do, to do this nowadays. So you have this uh, very powerful method, which is fluorescence. You can do a lot of things. Uh, you can have super resolution where you can um, really localize structures very well, but then you use typically out a bit on the dynamic side. And then um, you have um, so the problem that you have typically a limited number of channels you only can have observe uh, like maybe three, four, five, maybe nowadays it's even more fluor force at the same time. And, and then this fluor force of course are prone to bleaching and those things. Um, so they're, they're not super ideal, but um, this is very nice. So, but the, the biggest drawback is of course you sort of have to know what you want to label. Yeah, so you have to, of a nice functional label that uh, fluorescent label then actually will only bind to the structure of your interest preferentially. And then on the other side, you, you have quite the opposite, which is, for example, mass spectroscopy, um, where you have to take the analyte out of a complex uh, environment like a cell first, and then you purify, and then you, you short off um, the nature and then uh, charge it also, and then look at how it behaves in. In, in some sort of uh, under external influences that influence the motion. So you select uh, proteins via motion, and the motion reflects their, uh, their properties like uh, charge, electrodynamic radius, mass, and so on. So I was thinking it would be really nice if you could sort of do, do both things at the same time. So, what if you could shrink this uh, rather big uh, mass spectrometer and do something really small and put it at, uh, maybe inside a cell or closed it, so that, uh, that was sort of the dream. And uh, of course, the first thing you have to do is uh, you have to get rid of the sphere because it's just too big to 60 micrometers or no more spheres here. Can we use a rod to do this? Yeah. Problem, of course, if, if, you, if you have a, a single nanorod uh, and you want to see things in motion, uh, you face sort of a problem because the, the extent of the near field is about 50 nanometers. So you have to detect really, really fast. And if you want to detect something very small, really, really fast. You have to really, really carefully optimize the signal to noise. Yeah. So, and, um, but we thought maybe it's worthwhile. And even before I started my postdoc in Leiden, there was already a paper, in this case also by Verena Wolf, uh, the Gaston Svenuxen group, who had already looked at um, good nanoparticles and polystyrene particles, with, in this case, like 40 to 60 nanometer diameters. Diffusing wire rods, so they, they observed this as also a shift of plasma resonance again. So basically, the, the, the resonance of the SPR would shift and detract this. And then they actually look at the sort of a noisy trace, and from this noisy trace, they do an autocorrelation, uh, which I show up here. And from this autocorrelation, you can uh, get like parameters like the size of the particles. 
Um, this was a limited in time resolution due to the method that was used, which is uh, taking spectra. So I think they, they didn't go quite higher than, I think the last point here is around 60 microseconds. So it's uh, certainly not sufficient to detect a protein, which probably would diffuse by a few microseconds. So we, we thought we have to do this faster and we have to do this a lot faster. And that's uh, what I started in the Schultz group. And um, good thing is uh, we were successful. Um, this is from, from last year. So what we did different is instead of taking spectra of this nanoparticles and SPR, we just uh, go to um, with, uh, with, uh, with laser uh, with, uh, with the laser line onto the uh, the flank of an LSPR spectrum and just probe the, the scattered intensity. Yeah, and, and in this case, we actually did this uh, close to cross polarization, so we will suppress uh, to some extent the reflection by the slide. So it's uh, it's similar to dark field, but not really dark field. Yeah, which we we basically did to um, exclude uh, that we also get contributions directly from from the other light scattering. And um, we didn't want to look at proteins right away because proteins are sticky. So we decided to sort of um, have some sort of dummy protein, I would say. So in this dummy protein, in this case, are microemulsions, uh, microemulsion droplets. So specifically, this is like a, uh, like an oil enclosed by by a surfactant uh, in water. So they, they make this very nice stable droplets of a given size. Uh, and they are not very sticky. So, but, and the, the good thing is, since it's filled with a type of oil that simulates a protein very well, because uh, the, the refractive index is very, very similar to the similar permitted uh, composition in this case. And you can have high concentrations of them as well going about application because it's really a stable physical phase. Yeah. And then uh, we recorded time traces of the scattered intensity in this case. So you can already see this, that the time trace is just some microseconds long in this case. And we, we see all the small fluctuations, which in this case cannot really be attributed to the single microemulsion droplets, because there's just too many of them in the near field. But we can look at autocorrelations, which are shown here to the right side, and then fit a stretch exponent to it, and then we end up with the diffusion times that uh, match the expectation of what we, we think we, we should see for a nanometer particle going so a 50 nanometer near field. Um, so very nice. Um, yeah, the, the nice thing here is actually in this high concentration zero, I think you can't easily work with fluorescence uh, because you try to do FCS there, you will end up with very low contrast because you just have too many molecules in the focus, for example. So this would essentially work in, in a crowded environment like a cell already. Uh, what we then uh, did next is we exchanged this, um, this micro droplets by, by a good nanoparticle, which is uh, a bit more polarizable, but uh, also easier to see, uh, but smaller and faster. And what I showed down here is uh, autocorrelations of, of this particles floating by. So we look at the um, the scattered intensity by the rod again, and then we obtain this um, autocorrelations. So the black line is uh, in just water, and uh, then it shifts from the, the blue autocorrelation to the red autocorrelation um, when I increase the cholesterol content. So the increased viscosity correlation gets longer. Uh, well, what I should also mention here is that this five nanometer particles are charged, so it goes to both surface of the, of the non and, uh, and this particle will also carry a charge and they will actually uh, repel each other. So they will actually not enter the near field of the quad nanoparticle without uh, injecting additional electrolyte, which via device screening then um, mitigates the caloric pressure so it can actually enter the near field at one point. And that's uh, what I've done here with this autocorrelations. So at uh, like zero seconds, I increase the salt concentration, then I slowly ramp it up. And then you can also see as uh, the salt concentration ramps up over time. Also the autocorrelation comes up. So it's uh, indicating that the could now the, the five nanometer particles can come closer to the to the nanorod, yeah, and we tend to do this down to like, like 
well, 10 of nanoseconds, um, which is already very nice. So we, we have improved on the, the previous method by quite a margin here. And uh, what, was, what got even more interesting to us, uh, this, this was done at uh, lower concentrations, yeah, so nanomolar concentrations. And then um, what, what we figured is on the traces we observe, we see spikes or bursts. Yeah? So you see the ester resonance shifts, you know, have an intensity change and uh, Top here in blue, we are on the, the blue side of the plasmon, and here in red, we are on the red side of the plasmon. Uh, this is not done with the same rod because I think our laser at this time really allowed to, to address both sides, um, uh, particularly on, on, the, on the ones we use. And uh, then you can see this dips in intensity towards lower intensity here and towards higher intensity on the, for the right side. And this, Tips are indeed like single good nanoparticles diffusing into the near field. What's nice about this is, of course, if you have a single bursts, you can already analyze the single bursts and you can get way more information than, than, uh, than from just getting an autocorrelation. And then you can use this information, like for example, uh, the, the variance of such a burst and the maximum amplitude to, to get 2D distributions. And also for other dimensions like the, the length of this burst, you can add a multi-dimensional map. And what I what I show you on the right is a simulation for particles of different size, specifically 2.5, 3.7, and 5 nanometer diameter, where I plot like the, the same type of distribution. You can see that in this case, you could already have zones where when, when you had a single point in the zone, you could more or less say that the particle would have a certain size if you would know it's uh, composition. So if you probably need to know both, you also have to look at the time. But eventually there's a potential to like do single shot analysis of of particles. Of course the measurement still looks different. Uh, uh, that might also be to the reason that uh, I mean it flattens off here uh, that there's low repulsion still of course when the particles also come here, which in this simple Monte Carlo simulation is not taken into account. Yeah and um, then we thought we we well, we see single good nanoparticles. Can we do something to actually see single proteins? And um, for, for this, uh, we, we looked a bit on the rod. So what, when, um, you see when you excite your rod with a different polarization, it will scatter the, the, the light or along, polarized mostly along its axis. And you can analyze this at a other direction. But the reflection on this light will have uh, different orientational properties. So what you can do by this is basically by tuning the analyzed and uh, the incident polarization and the analyzed polarization. Um, you can sort of tune this interference formula to your advantage by uh, selecting how strong R and S so R is the, the uh, reflection coefficient of the glass light and S is the, the scattering amplitude on the rod and cosine beta is the, the phase between the both uh, interfering fields. So and um, what I plot down here is basically how, it, how the whole thing scales as, a, as a, this ratio of R over S and as a function of dimensionless uh, frequency key tuning. You can see for uh, and gamma is the Gouy phase, so basically at the Gouy phase of minus by half, you have confocal configuration. And then you can see actually when you have um, something like uh, where R equals S roughly, I think, I, you know, sort of approach uh, an optimum here, but in reality, you, you can't really go here. So the uh, problem is you always have additional noise on the detector. So if you take additional noise in the account, so this is a plot of signal to noise. Yeah, and uh, for down here is basically when you have a stronger uh, scattering than reflection, you can see what you want to have is a sort of R and S in, in the similar regime it could be better. And of course, there's also an influence of the phase, which I also will go into the next slide. Um, one thing I have to take into account here is when, when it comes to the phase difference, is that this is uh, actually a function of uh, the GUI phase, which you can tune by uh, shifting your focus or moving your samples with the focus slightly. And it's also a function of wavelengths, because the, the field scattered by the rod uh, will have a phase difference with respect to the incident field, depending on how much you're taking for from the 
from the plus one resonance and that's something what I'm, I'm uh, showing here for tools and what to scatter us a bit more and what and on what to scatter us less. Uh, so different scattering cross sections and what I change is basically the GUI face slightly as I, as I go from left to right. You can see the, the shape becomes asymmetric and you can have higher slopes at certain wavelengths. So the, the thing is uh, you have to, to actually optimize signal noise, you have to tune all these parameters. So it would be really, really nice if you you could have some sort of tool to actually do this with without having to inject proteins already. Um, and this is where phototronic comes in, um, which is for um, was um, well, what you do with phototrauma is basically when you when you hit the rod um, with a uh, with here five uh, heating beam at five thirty two nanometers, you create this uh, a refractive index lens around the nanoparticle, and well, what this in our case also does is you change the refractive index, you shift the plus one resonance, so it's very similar to what the the analyte would would do in the end. Yeah. So it's a uh, in any case, a uh, response to a refractive index change or effective refractive index change in the surrounding medium. And we have uh, also improved our setup. So we try to maintain the polarization state very well by using our uh, uh, peep splitters under very small angles, especially like hole cones. And, and also, we go into an inverted microscope as uh, tumors, which are inclined uh, by. 45 degrees, but in different planes, we bought them those from the same batch. So they actually compensate um, the balance of their uh, frenetic coefficients between S and P. And then what you can actually get if you're a line everything where you can get a phototrauma with a very high modulation depth, so um, up to 10% or more. And in this case, this was just with a heating power of 10, 10 microwatts and uh, pro power could be around 50. Uh, if you're a bit higher microwatts. So um, we can actually, and if you look at this, we will not be using a, a login for this. We, we actually will do an FFT um, by, by also doing FFT of the, the modulated signals on reference detectors. We also can determine phase differences. Uh, this has the advantage that you can modulate it to different frequencies for, for example, the, the blow laser and the, um, the or also the heating laser um, without having to have two log ends and we can take quite wide spectra. Um, well, what you can then check is as you rotate polarization, you can compare scattered light with, uh, with, with the phototrauma signal. So what you see here is uh, on the top uh, is a, a configuration where I rotate uh, the analyzer and the polarizer in a parallel configuration around the center axis. And so uh, below here, I, I call this PF for bike field. Um, below that is the corresponding phototrauma. And you can actually see that in each case, the, the phototrauma signal scales with the, the scattered intensity of the, the particles in the top rays and the top 2T scan. And uh, the same is the case if you use cross polarizers. And then around the center angle, the difference here is, of course, it's degenerate around 90 degrees, so it repeats. Um, also, the phototrauma does the same. So how does this look in a bit more detail? Uh, what I show here on the right-hand side is uh, the blue dots is a polar scan in parallel configuration for uh, non-rods of different sizes. So this one is, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, this was around 25 nanometers in diameter, and, and this one is 10 nanometers in diameter. And uh, what you see in the blue box is the detected intensity, so the, the interference signal between light scattered by the nano rod and the glass light. And uh, the red dots are the corresponding phototrauma signal. So in, in each case, I've uh, uh, normalized this to the maximum. So what happens here is basically uh, at this position, uh, you are orthogonal to the, the non rods axis, and you see only the reflection on the glass light. And then as you run both polarizers, you get more and more destructive interference and, and until you approach a minimum. And then you, as you approach the non rods long axis, um, and you are in, in line with the, the, the light scatter, the polarization that light is scattered on, uh, you also get. Uh, we get this peak again, uh, where you also find the highest phototrauma intensity. For smaller rods, uh, it's quite similar. 
So you basically start out uh, completely here at uh, roughly 90 degrees, uh, completely off axis of the nano rod, and then you go. In this case, the, the scattered uh, scattering cross section is way smaller than the reflection coefficient. So you end up just going into destructive interference when you align with the rod. But the photodrum comes out when you when you're basically on, on its maximum when you align with the rod. So there's two things you can take away with this. Um, one of them is that uh, that uh, you're mostly probing the scattering response to plus one shift of the rod uh, rather than actually a response from the trouble lens. And then you can do scans of uh, frequency over, over nano rods and uh, of different sizes and optimize your, your wavelengths, which is shown here. So the green lines are normalized intensities of uh, white light scattering spectra, and the, the blue dots are the corresponding for the normalized from the signals, uh, normalized to this uh, the overall detected intensity. So what you can see is for bigger rods, uh, scattering dominates, and you have the, the highest response sort of the slope is highest. But for smaller rods, this already changes, and you have the the, the strongest response actually in line with the plus one resonance, because uh, the the phase uh, the, the actually phase shift of the um, scattered light on uh, amongst I mean, amongst heating dominates. So this way you can align the rods, and then you can actually see some proteins. So in this case, I show a uh, glucose uh, oxidase. So what you see is a top trace, 10 milliseconds long, and on this trace, we see this bursts. Yeah, and this uh, was in this case from, from single molecules diffusing, but you can see they, they can last a couple of microseconds, but they can also be very short, few hundred nanoseconds. The longer ones are probably the, the proteins are still unspecifically sticking up into the good nano rod. Uh, we can also do this uh, for smaller protein, in this case uh, for hemoglobin, uh, well, in, in which case we also see nice bursts, uh, uh, also sticking in more like sticking time bursts. I mean, in the sticking on very short time scales in this case, if you compare this with what I've shown before, uh, the single point was like 20 milliseconds. This is in the real trace here. Is, uh, basically already shorter as uh, what I've shown, for example, for WGMs. Yeah, then you can actually analyze this bursts again. So uh, that's what we did. Um, uh, specifically, we analyzed them in this case uh, for uh, lengths. So basically half this. So we go to half the maximum and then go for long they are between the half maximum and we check also the rise time or long they take rise to half maximum and drop the lowest maximum. Of course, we can also uh, extract a uh, maximum amplitude, for example. Yeah, and then you, you do this, and then you can uh, plot distributions of these parameters, and then you find like rise and fall times for glucose oxidase on the order of 100 nanoseconds, um, which also are independent of each other as the 2D plot here shows. So it's telling you that going in and going out are independent processes as they should be. For hemoglobin, we find a bit longer time constants. Um, I think it's around 150 nanoseconds. Um, but hemoglobin is the smaller protein, so it just, uh, seems a bit counterintuitive. Um, um, but uh, actually, if you look at the autocorrelations of those proteins, you see one thing that a hemoglobin sticks a bit longer, but you also see that for glucose oxidase, you, you, you see the correlation. Uh, Really increases towards really short time scales. And then this time scales actually match relatively nice uh, with the rotational diffusion uh, time we would uh, expect for glucose oxidase, which is also the more asymmetric molecule. Uh, so we think uh, uh, this difference might actually arise to the fact that uh, we might indeed, or we speculate that, that this might be. Due to rotational diffusion, uh, which on, on this scale, I think, well, probably no one has really observed before, but uh, sometimes, uh, at least to my best knowledge. And I um, should also mention that this uh, rise times uh, match nicely the, the decay of the, the, the field to, to half. Uh, so if you calculate just the diffusion constant of the, of the protein, respectively, you find near field uh, root mean square. That is placements that match the half of the corresponding extent of the near field you would expect. So 
it's also quite nice. And then you can look at other properties like the, like the length of the event between uh, between half months and the maximum amplitude. And you see uh, this distributions for thermal grouping. You can see the, uh, this, uh, it looks a bit more complicated in the scratch. For box, it's different. So for box, it actually matches a single exponential. Uh, so it's a single exponential fitted to a log logarithmic deep pentistogram. So, um, very nicely, so which uh, says that this is um, maybe a very clearly a long absorption process, which is only covered for by one rate. Framework grouping, it's already a bit more more complicated. We here we uh, fit two rates, but I think it's actually maybe a contribution of many many rates that as the protein might uh, stick differently as it orientates differently on the surface. We also see that uh, higher higher amplitudes are more clearly related with longer sticking periods, which such as maybe that the parts of the protein that are more polarizable are also more sticky. Okay, I think with this I'm uh, quickly approaching my time. Uh, I want to send uh, thank my my whole team in Leiden, uh, Michel Reed's team in Leiden, which has been a, a very nice hosting tool for me over the past four years. And I also want to send my, my funding in this case there. The European uh, Commission. And I thank you for attention and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks, Martin. So it's very nice talk on the single protein detection. So if you have any questions, you can ask uh, directly or you can also write on the chat. So, anyone? Okay, maybe I, I, I start with, maybe I understood, but maybe I didn't understand completely. So the diffusion time, even for the, as for the protein or even for the micro emulsion, yeah. it will be different close to the near field compared to the bulk, right? In the near field, because you have a temperature gradient and that will influence on the diffusion time because yeah, of course the viscosity will be different. And in addition to there could be also some thermophoresis effect, right? Will that somehow do you see it in your so, measurements? So uh, I haven't really looked into this yet. Uh, that was actually what I wrote a more proposal on. Uh, and we wanted to do this with autocorrelations, uh, but we, we have to really check this yet. So the, that's actually a good idea we, to, to make the water a bit hotter with uh, maybe the heating beam and see how this influences mm. uh, the diffusion times. Yeah. That's yeah. a good suggestion. I think we should really do this in the future. Okay. It would be really interesting to, to look at thermophoresis at like the nanoscale. Yeah, that, that, would that be nice. Actually can, because it's close to surface at where, it's, where it might be complicated, but yeah, that would be, that would be really nice to do. Yeah. Okay, is there any more questions? So may I just Yeah, Fung, go ahead. Uh, a short question to that, I mean, isn't isn't the um, the effect or the thermophoresis at the end preventing even the entering of the near field? Uh, so that um, if the the protein is either um, uh, too strongly repelled thermophoretically, um, you wouldn't see anything anymore. Uh, is that just counterproductive? Yeah, might uh, depend on the theory coefficient of the protein, right? Um, yeah, so if it doesn't come closer anymore, you will see less, but I think you can ramp the heating power and just use it as a, another means to get additional dimensions uh, out of the of the distributions. Yeah, so you could maybe distinguish between two different proteins via their three coefficients um, by how to react to heating. Yeah. So it might not necessarily be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but of course, this has to be done carefully. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, do you know the heating or the how much you eat the gold nano rod? Oh, uh, I would have to calculate. So, we are probably sending quite some power. Um, I don't have the number in mind right now. I certainly, I uh, had yeah, more increase than probably uh, simply 10 degrees Celsius or something, I would say. Okay. So. And may Probably I also shortly ask, uh, do you do anything to the, the uh, substrate surface, um, special kind of treatment that nothing sticks to that? Or in this case, uh, we, we use the glass surface and we just uh, UV print the uh, good nanoparticles. We're currently working on surface modifications. 
Um, I think in this case, we kind of get lucky with the proteins that are behaving well under the circumstances. If you use a BSA, for example, it will just stick to the surface on, um, we also tried IgG, which also just covers the rot immediately. Yeah? Or like, so this, this is a bit uh, more um, nicer proteins. We also see longer events where, which I haven't shown you, where you also have like uh, sticking for a bit longer times, especially for, for hemoglobin. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really a bit of a, a gamble. Also, the, the, the thing is, if you modify the, 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 the surface of the, the good nanoparticle, you, you have to make a treat of. So, you, the, you should, uh, you want to have a hydrophobic chain or something, yeah, like a short pack or something. And then, of course, this blocks access to the near field already. Um, uh, so, you have to, to have this rather short. And the other effect is, of course, if you uh, have a lot of dial binding to the particle surface, you also broaden the, the, the line of the plasma, yeah, so yeah. plasma gets worse. Um, you're currently doing this for uh, my student, Nasli, um, which will continue the work as currently doing this with Undi and we get good results for good particles diffusing by. So this, uh, there might be something coming up where we also can go to um, uh, naturally more sticking proteins. I think the stick into the glass might not really matter for the big nanoparticles because the because the dips are relatively far away for, for, from the surface. The, the, we use 40 nanometer particles, for example. Okay. Uh, that is if the proteins form a single layer only. Uh, they do something more complex. Uh, they might also block the nano over time. Yeah. Okay. okay, is there any questions? Maybe I, I, I quickly ask uh, one question. Uh, so I see in the time press where you see the pikes, uh, for example, one case, uh, yeah, here, maybe before, much more before, like in the cavity and nano rods case. Yeah, okay. And there we see, uh, okay. yes, this one, this one, yeah. So yeah. we see spikes, which so because of the nano rods coming and go away, but we see also the background signal is modulating. On yeah, it's line. drifting. Uh, the, that's because the cavities are sensitive to everything, so that's temperature. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, micro Kelvin changes, or at least milli Kelvin changes easily. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, this is uh, uh just see everything. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's also the bottleneck of this type of resonators. You're sensitive to everything, and then you only thing you can filter things apart. It's uh, but also mm -hmm. looking at the time scale which signals happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So then I thanks Martin again. Okay. And yeah, Thank now. You. So I will stop sharing. <laughs> yes. Okay, now I, let's go to uh, missiles. Yeah.